We all know we have to diversify our portfolios, but how do you actually go about doing that? Well, a key skill is being able to calculate the correlation between pairs of assets. So in this video, I'm going to take you through that process step by step. And there's also a spreadsheet which you can download from my website. Now, it turns out that some financial journalists may have got one of those key correlations wrong. So let's find out about that in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. Let's start by looking at what we mean by correlation. The essential question we're trying to answer with correlation is whether the prices of two assets move up and down together. So here are some imaginary prices moving up and down for one asset and another asset. And you can see they always move in the same direction. When this one moves up, so does the other. When this one moves down, so does the other. And we call that positive correlation. If the assets move in opposite directions, so when one moves up, the other one moves down, and vice versa, then we'd call that negative correlation. When one asset zigs, the other asset zags. And the third case might be where two assets just ignore one another completely, and they just do their own thing. And in that case, the two assets would be uncorrelated. What I'd like to do is to explain correlation in terms of surprise. To illustrate that, let's look at the returns of the FTSE 100 over the last 35 years. These are the daily returns, in other words, the percentage by which the closing price of the FTSE changed from day to day. And most of the time, the returns were completely unsurprising and not far away from zero. On very rare occasions, we had surprisingly large positive returns, as you can see here in 2008, or surprisingly large negative returns as you can see here in 1987. And this concept of surprise will help you understand the narrative that you see almost every day in the financial media. Here's a fairly typical example from the BBC, which describes how much the FTSE 250 fell in one day. It fell by 1.6%. But how surprising is that? It turns out that every 41 days, the FTSE would fall by 1.6% or more. So it's not really that surprising at all. A very frequently cited reason for the FTSE 100 moving is due to the fluctuation of sterling. And in this FTSE article, they explicitly claim that a strong pound can frustrate UK companies because it decreases their international revenues once converted back into sterling. And later on, we'll see whether the evidence supports that. And as it's quoted so often, you'd think there must be some truth behind it. So let's look at exactly what we might mean by surprise. We'll take the return on a given day and subtract the average return. And in fact, the average return for a stock is usually very, very small, not far from zero. So the numerator here will tell us whether the return is above average or below average, and whether the surprise is positive or negative. But then we have to scale the return by the typical return size. And that tells us whether it's larger than usual or fairly typical. And the name we give to that typical return size is volatility. Now, don't be scared by this equation. It's just the way we usually write this surprise measure. The symbol used is Z, and that's why we call this a Z score, where Z would stand for surprise. And as before, we take the return on a given day, R, we subtract the average return, and we divide by the volatility, which is the typical size of the daily returns. We'll take those thousands of returns and group them into buckets. So this bucket would be very close to zero, Positive surprises would go into these buckets, and negative surprises would go into these buckets. And what you can see is that almost all of the time the surprise measure falls into this range of about plus two to minus two. And those kind of returns would simply not be surprising at all. Very occasionally we venture into these tails when extreme events happen, and we get a very large positive surprise on the stock market. And if it's bad news, then we get a very large negative surprise. And to draw our line in the sand, we'll choose a surprise measure of plus three or more, which only happens 1% of the time. And the same is true for negative returns. They're less than minus 3.3, only 1% of the time. So these would mark events which only happen one day in 100. To illustrate that, we can look at some actual days where we have very large positive or negative returns. And we can judge them using this surprise measure. On this day in November 2008, the FTSE rose 9.8%. So to gauge our surprise, we subtract the average return for the FTSE 100, which is very small. We could have just ignored this. 
and we scale by the typical size of the FTSE daily return, which is 1%. And the result is a Z-score of 9.1. So this was an astonishingly surprising positive return for the FTSE 100. And in 1987, the FTSE fell by 12% in October and was a truly shocking event. Now that we understand this concept of surprise, we can explain correlation in terms of synchronised surprise. Instead of looking at one asset, here we've got the returns of the FTSE 100 on the x-axis, ranging from plus 10% to minus 10%. And on the y-axis, we have the value of sterling versus the euro, ranging from about plus 3% to minus 4% because developed market currencies tend to be less volatile than stock markets. The daily returns are colour-coded, such that if both the FTSE and sterling versus the euro go up together, they'll be shaded in orange, and if they fall together, they'll be shaded in red. And I've also shown the count of the number of days when that occurred. If the FTSE 100 and sterling are correlated, then we'd expect lots of cases where they move in the same direction, either down or up together. But in fact, we get almost as many cases where they move in opposite directions. Either the FTSE moves down and sterling moves up, or the FTSE moves up and sterling moves down. And that suggests that the FTSE and sterling are simply not correlated. Whereas if we look at the DAX index, which is the German stock market index, versus the FTSE 100, and again, we count how many days the FTSE and DAX move in the same direction, versus days when they don't move in the same direction, they move in the same direction three times as often as they don't move in the same direction. And that's because they have a very high correlation, which makes perfect sense because they're both driven by similar factors, because they're both European indices. So by taking the daily surprise measures for two series, X and Y, and multiplying them together, then taking the average of that product, we come up with a measure for correlation. And this is exactly how we define the Pearson correlation coefficient. And the correlation increases either when x and y move up together or they move down together. And it decreases when they move in opposite directions, either up and down or down and up. And that's because the product of two positive numbers is positive and the product of two negative numbers is also positive. Whereas multiplying a positive and a negative will give a negative contribution to the correlation. And here's the way we write the usual definition of Pearson correlation. It's given the symbol rho, the letter E stands for expectation, and it's the expected value of the product of the surprise in X multiplied by the surprise in Y. It's always worthwhile actually looking at the returns plotted against one another, because if there is a correlation, you'll see it very quickly. So in this block, you can see the correlation of the FTSE 100 with sterling versus the euro. And when it looks spherical like this, it means that there's very little correlation. Whereas if we look at DAX versus sterling, there's this very elongated sausage shape. Because when the DAX moves up, so does the FTSE 100. And when the DAX moves down, so does the FTSE 100. They both surprise in the same direction. And that's reflected in the actual correlation number. The correlation between the FTSE 100 and DAX is about 0.81, which is very high. Whereas the correlation with sterling is very small and slightly negative. One of the difficulties with correlation is that as you compare more and more series, the matrix becomes explosively large. Here are 28 funds from Vanguard compared with one another, and what we end up with is a very large matrix. And using the statistical language called R, it's possible to visualize that correlation matrix very easily, such that a positive correlation becomes a big blue circle and a negative correlation is a big red circle. And that lets you see that the stock funds are very highly correlated. And the bond funds generally have low correlation with stocks. And that's why correlation matters. If you have a combination of stocks and bonds, it will diversify your portfolio. And this works in practice. On the left, we can see the correlation of VUKE, which is a UK FTSE 100 tracker, and VGov which is a UK government bond tracker, and their correlation is minus 0.2. It's negative, because when one moves up, the other one moves down, and vice versa. If we annualise the daily move of the FTSE 100, it comes out at about 14%, whereas UK government bonds are about half of that, or 7%. But if we have a portfolio containing both the FTSE 100 tracker 
and the government bond tracker roughly in the ratio of 3 to 1, then your overall portfolio volatility is less than either of those two assets, just 5%. And that's because of the diversification due to the negative correlation. That was the theory, but now let's look at exactly how correlation is calculated in practice. If you're going to use a spreadsheet, it's a two-step process. First you calculate the asset returns, which is the percentage change over a day, or a week, or a month. And then we use the function corel, which worked out the correlation between each pair of assets. To illustrate this, I've used four series. One is a global real estate fund, another is the price of gold in US dollars, one is a US treasury fund, and the fourth is an S&P 500 tracker. To calculate the daily return, we take the price on a given day, divide by the price on the previous day, and subtract 1. And then we'd format it as a percentage. So on September the 5th, 2007, this real estate fund increased in value by 1.9%. And we can drag that down for a month and copy it across for the other assets. And if we want to work out the correlation between two of these assets over one month, we'd use the coral function, which is the same in Google Sheets as it is in Excel. We'd select this month's returns for the real estate fund, and then we'd select a month's returns for gold, and those are in columns G and H. And we can see the correlation is minus 0.46 over that month. A key thing to understand about correlation is that it varies all the time. So what I've done is calculate the daily returns for 2009, which is during the financial crisis and its aftermath. And I've compared that with the daily returns in 2017, which had very strong equity returns all over the world. I've put the results into a correlation matrix. So for example, in cell C2, you can see I've calculated the correlation in column B of daily returns in 2017 with column C of the daily returns in 2017, and so on for each of those cells. And I've done the same thing for the returns in 2009. And in this sheet, I compare the two. The correlation matrix for 2017 is here, and the correlation for 2009 is here. And you can see the correlations are quite different. In 2017, for example, gold and US treasuries were positively correlated, but the correlation between the two was much lower in 2009. And the correlation between gold and the S&P 500 was negative in 2017, but approached zero in 2009. So one word of caution would be that if you just look at long-term correlations, which I've done for weekly returns here at the bottom, that won't necessarily tell you about what happens during a crisis or during a very strong rally, when equity markets are rising very strongly. And that's why we sometimes look at something called rolling correlation. What I've done for each of these rows is look back over a year of weekly returns and then calculate the correlation between each pair of assets. And there are six combinations of assets because we're looking at four series. I've colour coded it so that a negative correlation is in green and a positive correlation is in red. And as we scroll downwards, keep your eye on the correlation of gold to the S&P 500 in column F. It starts off negative in 2008, but then can you see how it goes positive in 2011? Then negative again around 2012, then positive again in 2012, and then negative again. So that correlation is extremely unstable. Whereas if we look at column G, which is the correlation of US treasuries and US stocks, that starts off negative at minus 0.44, and although it does fluctuate, it stays negative almost all of the time. And that's why US Treasuries are a better hedge for US stocks than gold. And I've plotted those rolling correlations in this graph. The green line at the bottom is the correlation between US Treasuries and US stocks. And again, you can see how that's almost always negative. Whereas if you look at US real estate and US stocks, the correlation there is almost always positive. So if you have both US property stocks and US equities in your portfolio, they'll double up your risk. Whereas US treasuries and US stocks would decrease your risk because of the negative correlation. 
So I strongly recommend you try this out for yourself. There's no better way to learn than to get your hands dirty with some real data. You'll find the link to the spreadsheet in the description below. And remember, if you have any trouble at all, you can always look at our PensionCraft website, pensioncraft.com contacts, and get in touch with me directly for a one-to-one. -one. Now, if you found this video useful, and many of you tell us that you do find them useful, then why not join our growing list of patrons and support us with as little as $5 a month, like Kishore Bhagwat, Ian Stenton, and Robert Bradbury. If you do support us, you get lots of other benefits, such as joining our weekly live Q&A, and access to all of our previous Q&A sessions, and also we can do some bespoke analysis for any assets that we can find time series for. So we'd love to see you at our Q&A, and as always, thank you for listening.